at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. All the world will praise your great name. Your great name. All the weak find their strength at the sound of your great name hungry souls receive grace at the sound of your great name the fatherless they find their rest at the sound of your great name the sick are healed and the dead are raised at the sound of your great name jesus worthy is the lamb that was slain for us the son of god and man All the world will praise your great name, your great name. Redeemer, my healer, Lord, almighty, defender, my Savior, you are. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. All the world will praise your great name, your great name. Well, good morning, everyone. It has been a hot sec since I've been up here leading. Um, just wanted to start off by saying, um, when you come here to church, when you came here today, you might have thought, I wonder who's, on, who's leading today. I wonder who I'm going to watch doing the worship and um, you know, listen to the, the sermon. But kind of want you to frame your thinking a little bit differently today. You didn't come here to watch me and these guys. Where did I lost a drummer? Um, <laughs> you didn't come here to watch us play, like this is a, a show. You guys are just as much a part of the worship team as we are up here. You guys add your voices to this, so that's what I want you guys to do with us today. So I want you to stand with me. So we're gonna do something a little bit different today too because I know we're a Mennonite church, we don't really do this, but I want everyone to raise your hands. One hand, two hands, three hands. Um, I want everyone to just put your hands in the air and we're just gonna give it to God this morning. I don't see any hands, I'm still waiting for those hands. There we go, a little bit, you can do better. I, I still see people not with hands in the air. All right, that's good enough. So why don't you sing with me? Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled. With Glory. 
stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength we bow down we worship him now how great how awesome is he and together we Oh, 
God, sing with me, I'll praise our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. It's your love that took our place It's your blood that gives us liberty We are thankful for the cross On the cross mercy was revealed for the cost, there you died and rose again. We are thankful for the cross. In my your blood, we stand forgiven. So, in the news, you know, it's always the news. <laughs> um, a lot of stuff going down in Afghanistan right now. Um, weighed heavily on my mind, just so heavily. Um, there are people living in absolute fear and terror right now. Um, so I picked this song um, because we don't want to be a people that live in fear and, in, in fear and terror. 
um, but we, we worship the one who's overcome, and despite what comes our way, uh, we're going to do that, so... Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned. But suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority, every victory. a sound light in this broken land all authority every victory by the 
blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, everyone overcome, and we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, everyone overcome. Welcome to College Drive. Hope that uh, this start has been good for you to get your, your heart, your mind, your thoughts uh, in the right direction uh, for worship. <clears throat> My name is Kimball. I'm lead pastor here in case you haven't uh, met me before, haven't had an opportunity to meet you, or if you're, you're new with us. Uh, it's always uh, good to see some new faces, good to see some that have uh, been traveling and returning. Uh, if you are new with us, we'd love to know that you were here with us. We have a, at our welcome desk, there's a little connection card. You can fill that out and leave it there with them and they'll pass it on to me or to our ushers. And then we would be able to know how to contact you if you would like that, just to, to let you know some more things about, uh, about our church and the ministries, how you can get involved. I want to let you know of a few things. I, I will be straight up honest with you is that uh, I feel like I'm, I'm really wanting a vacation <laughs> and I'm going on one on Tuesday for a couple of weeks and I also feel this kind of weight and, and sort of apprehension about the fall um, just because it's, it's kind of hurtling towards us. But I think it's somewhat my, maybe my expectations and maybe not yours because I don't know exactly what you're thinking fall is going to be like. <laughs> Um, but we, we anticipate starting up and, and having ministries uh, in motion. And we honestly have some, some pretty big gaps in some of those things. And so for me, leaving on vacation at this time is like, oh, you know, am I, I, I really, you can pray for me about that. Because I do feel like I need to sort of escape things a little bit <laughs> after this year. But I also know coming back, it's, it's going to be uh, yet uh, um, in motion. But uh, if you are, are thinking, man, how could, we, how could I get involved in, in the life of the church? And if there's areas that you would like to be involved, uh, please contact me, contact our church through our, our email or our uh, social media, and, uh, or just stick a note somewhere in the box and just say, hey, contact me. I'd love to talk about how I could be involved. Because we need, we need your involvement. We need, uh, we need support and help in areas. And, and uh, I think it's good for you too to use your gifting and, uh, and in that. So one of the areas that we do have been talking about is Gulp. We're looking forward to starting our, our lunch program that, that for our college students that come on Wednesdays. And it's, it's a pretty sweet deal. They get two bucks, they have two bucks and uh, they get a lunch, pass the lunch, get to join here in the building. And that's what we're anticipating starting. And so uh, if you want to be involved in that, I know it's, it's during the day on Wednesday, which doesn't work for everybody, but there's other avenues that you can, can help or help clean up after different things like that. Charmaine would love to hear how she could involve you in one of our teams. Uh, as far as that goes. So connect with her about that. Uh, another thing that I want you to be involved with or, or thinking about is our life groups. And we're starting that in mid-September. And we've been, we've kicked in already our, our series in, in the gospel of, of Jesus according to Mark. And so we've been in that for a little while, but we're going to start moving in the area of getting into home groups and life groups. And we have some areas of need in that. So pretty much uh, all of our life groups that we have are, are getting pretty full. And so we, we're looking for some new host homes, some new leaders. And so talk to me about that. And if you're interested in being involved in a life group, uh, it's a great way to really kind of flesh out and talk about the things that we discuss and we teach on, on Sunday mornings in uh, the context of a community group. <clears throat> uh, all right, and along with that, I want to give you, again, the heads up of what's happening on, on starting on September 12th. We are, uh, that's the week I get back from holidays, but we're going to start in on, on uh, sort of talking about focusing on the, the healing miracles of Jesus. And so Sunday morning, we're going to take on one of those stories. And the, the accounts in the Gospel of Mark, 
that, that deal with Jesus interacting with people that have areas of, of physical need and where he touches them, where he heals them. And what we're going to be doing is starting that morning and then through that week is have opportunities for you to come. So Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. And uh, we, we don't even know how it's going to look yet. But we're going to um, read the text, share a few thoughts on it, and then have opportunities to, to pray for healing. And like I said, we don't even know what it's going to look like. Uh, but I, I do remember the, the words of Wayne Gretzky, who said, you know, you miss every shot that you don't take or something like that. And so applying that spiritually, you know, we don't know what God's going to do. And so we're going to pray and we're going to ask and we're going to seek him. And some of you have some health issues. And we, we know that this is not to be done for our glory or, and fully our benefit, but it's to bring... Uh, the, bring praise to the name of Jesus. And so what God would do, we don't know, but we invite you to be a part of that. It, you, we would love for you to come every night that, that week. Uh, we, we're going to have our, our board of elders and our preaching team and others that will be a part of that. And we're going to pray for, for physical healing uh, for you. And so it's, uh, it's just going to be saying, God, uh, we believe that you can. We believe that you can. And so that's, uh, that's going to start on the 12th and go through that week. All right. Um, I'm going to invite a few people to come up that sadly we're going to be saying a bit of a farewell to you. And so I'm going to ask Zach and Keely and Hazel, as well as Johannes and Emily, to come on up here. And I know we did this last week with Yannick and Julia and Abby. Um, and, and so this isn't, our, this isn't our desire <laughs> as much to say. Um, Farewell. We'd rather say welcome. Uh, speaking of that, we are going to have a, a lunch in September to meet some people that are new in our church, a newcomer's lunch. But these folks are, are leaving us, heading off on a, a different direction, some not too far away, some a little bit farther. Uh, but uh, you can join me up here if you want to pray blessing over you. <clears throat> um, Johannes and Emily have been with us for a while now and have been very involved in in various areas of our kids ministry, young adults, and life group ministry, probably something else that I'm missing. Yeah, that's a good spot over there. Let's see, I, um, And so these guys are, are heading back to the farm, to Bow Island. And so they're uh, moving down, down the highway a little bit. But we want to pray blessing over you guys and obviously your uh, family starting coming soon. And, uh, and again, just say thank you so much for your involvement and your ministry with us. Uh, these guys went through our leadership course in the spring, and, and uh, so you're, you're geared up, you're ready, you're prepared, you've had good experience, and uh, we know you'll be very involved in the church in Bow Island. And these fine folks here you may not have got to know too well, been with us for a little while, but uh, Zach and Keely and, and little Hazel, um, just a great little family and I've been attending and uh, these guys are heading off to Abbotsford and Zach is going to be attending Columbia Bible College and, and looking to do a theology degree and so um, yeah we just want to say blessing on, on you folks as well. We were looking forward to getting to know you more but who knows where our, uh, our paths will, will cross again. We said last week that the church is a river, not a lake, and so we're just grateful that we're able to bless you guys and pray, uh, pray God's best over you. So join me in doing that. God, we, uh, we lift these, these families to you. We thank you for how you have used them, how you've drawn them to us, for friendships that we have made here, and we pray your blessing on them as they go and connect with, uh, with a new family, new churches, and new opportunities. Lord, we pray for Johannes and Emily. Uh, thank you for their involvement, their ministry here. Uh, we pray that the transition to the farm would be easy, there'd be good family relations, and, and just uh, stepping into areas of, of uh, possibility of volunteering in the church in Bow Island. Uh, bless them. And also with their, with their little one on the way, pray for a safe arrival. 
Um, God, we do um, thank you for how Zach and Keeley just kind of came into our midst here, and um, it was so good to start to get to know them. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity that's before them and going to BC. We pray um, just for a, a clear, I don't know yet if they found a, a place to be, home yet for them, but I pray that that would be work out really well for them, and I pray that everything would move smoothly for him in, in uh, choosing courses and getting settled in, and also opportunities for, for Keeley, and uh, thanks for the joy that, that Hazel is to them. I pray that would continue too. So from all of us uh, of our church, we bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> And I'm going to ask Emily to stay up here. She's going to lead us in prayer today. Good morning. So I wanted to share a quote um, from one of my favorite books that I've found so far. And it's called, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. And the author is Lisa Turkhurst. And the quote reads, God loves you too much to answer your prayer at any other time than the right time. Let's repeat that. God loves you too much to answer your prayer at any other time than the right time. So, let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning with our individual requests, petitions, sorrows, joys, and questions. You know our prayers and you know our hearts. May you grant us a spirit of trust, one that finds peace in trusting your timing, and one that finds joy in knowing you love us. May we not seek to understand your ways, nor your reasoning. Remove these desires within us. Lord, we declare our trust in you. We also lift up the church ministries to you. May leaders and volunteers rise up to fill these positions. Grant us the boldness to step outside of our comfort zone and to plug into the church in new capacities. And we thank you too for Tanya and Kimball, for their hearts of service and spirits of love. Grant them rest during their upcoming vacation and may they find rest in knowing that you will provide. Amen. This morning as we <clears throat> come to hear the word of the Lord, I want to invite you to start and maybe you always start this way. Maybe you've started earlier already this morning with this spiritual intention to have your ears opened as we hear from God's word in the, found in the gospel of Mark chapter 4. And we hear the words of Jesus that said to those who listened or who were hearing him that day, let him who has ears, let him hear. And so I want to invite you to start this, uh, this hearing time, to invite the Spirit of God to tune your ears to his voice and to allow the, the word that you will hear today to, to find a, a fertile soil that it will be planted into your heart today. So Jesus says to, to us today, to listen, to pay attention, to have our ears open. I'm going to pray, and then we will, we will hear the word of God being read. God, thank you that we can come today into this place that we can also hear online, that we can tune our, our thoughts to, to your voice, we know there's lots of distractions, there's lots of things that are, are easily moving our, our thoughts away from you in these days. But we just simply call out to you and say that we want to hear from you. We want to open our, our hands to receive from you. That our hearts would be soft. that you would protect us from the evil one who would seek to cause division, would cause strife, would cause disunity in anything among us. 
that we would simply hear from you in these moments. Amen. Mark 4, verses 1 to 20 says, Again he began to teach by the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. So that... They may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And then he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure it for a while. And then when tribulation or persecution persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word. The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. All right, we uh, we obviously videoed that at camp and you wouldn't believe how hard it is to find a quiet spot on the water at camp. There was maintenance guys were weed trimming and guys on the boats that were trying to you know get their boats going I don't know it was it was nuts we found a few moments there to have that film but <clears throat> thought it'd be kind of nice to see the the water as this is a, a waterfront story a parable that Jesus uh, is telling uh, to us today as well I, I forgot to mention uh, before that that you could have followed along in your journal on page 22 or in your Bibles in Mark chapter 4, we're going to be looking at those verses a little more in-depthly, verse 1 to 20. If you, uh, again, do not have one of these Mark journals, we do have some available at the back, some things just for you to, to follow along and take some notes as you like. <clears throat> All right, I want to give you a few just initial thoughts, some initial observations coming to this, this text. Uh, this, I would say, is, is a dream text for most preachers. Uh, because it's got got four points uh, and a pretty clear application of such. Uh, which soil are you? And so we see ourselves in uh, in this text, as we always should see ourselves in in Scripture, how it applies to us. So Jesus is is speaking. Jesus is teaching, and this is known as a parable. Uh, there's less parables in the Book of Mark than in the other Gospels. Um, And so there's lots of things that Mark talks about that that Jesus was doing, was teaching, but a lot more of what he was doing. It's very much an action-oriented book. We've been talking about that. But in the life of Jesus, in his teachings, uh, people that have done some... uh, I talked about math last week. There's some people that like to do this kind of thing, but they figured out there's about one-third of the teaching of Jesus was parabolic, or using parables. And so a parable is simply a a story typically with one key spiritual truth or point of application and so where jesus takes things that are on on earth 
things that we would understand, things that people would understand or relate to, and, and allows that story to reveal a, a spiritual or a heavenly truth. So we, we see that Jesus, uh, after he's, uh, he's had kind of this day where, if, you know, if it follows from where we were last week, uh, and now he's, he's got it, there's a crowd gathering, right? There's things that he's been doing, he's been healing people. He's been setting people free from unclean spirits. And things are kind of catching on, there's crowd following. We heard last week that things were so bad that it says him and his disciples, they couldn't even eat. It was, there were so many people around. And so the crowd is gathering, and so they've come around, and he has found his way down to the Sea of Galilee, and he gets into the boat to teach them uh, from the water. But it's interesting that the actual Greek here, when it says this, it says, he got into a boat to sit on the sea. <laughs> and I don't know, I just, I love that. It, it kind of, we kind of miss it in our, in our English language, right? But it's, he got into a boat to sit on the sea. And some commentators that, that have studied this, they say, well, anyone that would have read this initially from this background and reading it in Greek, they would have said, well, who sits on the sea? Who can sit on the sea? Only God. God alone, the one who created the sea. And we're going to see throughout uh, the book of Mark, and you'll hear uh, Lane, Lane is, who is leading us this morning, he's going to speak in a couple weeks uh, about Jesus calming the sea. So I don't want to steal any of his thunder on it, right? Lane's like, don't, don't do it, right? He's got enough. But we're going to see in the book of Mark these examples where, where Jesus is, he actually sits on the sea, he stills the sea, and he walks on the sea. And so Mark is saying a very clear thing here is that, that Jesus, as God, has authority over all things, over all of creation. So that's a, that's a pretty cool observation. This parable is agricultural. <laughs> It may be harder and harder for some of our younger generation that we've moved farther and farther away from an agricultural society. But some of us were, were raised on a farm or were raised in a small farming community. How many of you were kind of raised around the farm? I know, you know, all right, so a bunch of you. And, and you would see this, and this makes pretty good sense to you as far as seeds that are planted and seeds that will actually grow into something. <laughs> Uh, we understand sowing, planting, and as farmers go, we say, sometimes there's a harvest, <laughs> right? Um, but we see multiplication happen, and we understand that the type of, of soil the seed lands on is important, as well as the need for sun and water, those things. This, this makes sense to a good portion of us, and I think most of us could grow to understand it. Verse 9 then Jesus says, he who has ears to hear. Some are going to get it. And some won't. This is a reality. Some people are going to receive this, and some will not. It springs off of last week, where we, we ended talking about the, the parentheses, the, that um, mathematical picture of those who are inside. There are those who are inside. They, they perceive it, they hear it, they understand, and they actually do it. Jesus says, those who do the will of God, that's my family. These are the ones who, who hear and change. There's going to be some who hear it and some who just don't get it. Here's the disciples. They're part of this crowd, right? They're part of the crowd that is gathered along the shore. Jesus sitting on the sea in the boat. And the disciples are there. And as Jesus teaches this, it, it doesn't say this initially, but it gets to the point afterwards where they're alone with Jesus. And he explains the parable to them and, because they say, we don't get it. But you can imagine if they were part of the crowd at first. Right? You got Peter, James, John, all of them. They're all, all the boys. They're all there. 
And Jesus is speaking from the boat. And he's saying this parable. And they're going, you know, they're the ones that were chosen to be with Jesus, to be around Jesus. And they're saying, amen, amen. Oh, good word, good word, preacher. Oh, man, just got me right in the feels. But then, when they have Jesus alone, <laughs> they're saying, what you talking about, Jesus? <laughs> what, are you, what, are you, what are you talking about? We don't understand this parable that you have said to us. They don't get it. So he explains it to them. <clears throat> one of the observations we come out of this with is, is sort of the harsh reality of there's one in four, right? 25%. And I still um, am puzzled by this at times. I mean, even though I see it, we see it in our world all the time, as far as obviously not every one of the, on the planet, the 7.8 billion people, um, some obviously have not heard about Jesus. And we're called to share. We hope they will hear. We pray and we ask that God would use us to bring the message to them. But they don't all receive it. But I, I get sometimes a bit <clears throat> puzzled thinking about the times of Jesus, again, watching the things that he did, hearing the parables, hearing the Son of God, the creator of all, the sustainer of all, speaking to them and their hearts could not perceive it. They could not understand it. That there would only be 25% fruitfulness that Jesus is saying. This is the principle, one in four. There's a lot of people, we see this continually through the Gospels, that deserted Jesus. They heard what he said. Maybe they thought about it, puzzled. They couldn't perceive it. Their minds could not understand it. And so they ditched him. Jesus. We see this in, in different circumstances throughout the Gospels. The rich man talks to Jesus. He says, this is what you need to do. And the, and the rich man, you know, had the thorn of wealth in his life and he just walked away, sadly. Turned his back on Jesus. We see also in the Apostle Paul, uh, and maybe I've mentioned this before, I don't know why this is one of my favorite verses. It's not really one of my favorite verses, but it's, it's somehow encouraging to me. 2 Timothy 1 verse 15, Paul says, The entire province of Asia has deserted me. <laughs> I'm like, you think, why would that encourage you? I'm like, Tanya and I, we just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary, also our 30th year of, of pastoral ministry. We got married, we had a short honeymoon, we had no money, so we drove my parents' Ford Cougar XR7 to the coast. <laughs> Anyways, it <laughs> doesn't matter. And then we went to Yorkton, Saskatchewan, started in ministry about 30 years ago. And as I look back on 30 years, there is the faces that, that come into my mind. People that I shared a lot of time with, shared a lot of of messages on Jesus that are, are no longer walking with Jesus, that have left the faith. And so when I read that the whole province of Asia deserted Paul, I don't think that's a, it's not something to celebrate, but I look at it and say, I, I've, there's been people that have left the faith that I've known, but I haven't lost the province. There's been people that have left our church in this last year, and it's not necessarily that they've left the faith. But any time someone, someone leaves, someone departs, goes another way, I, I, you feel that. You feel the tug of that. You feel the sorrow of that loss of relationship. One of the young uh, staff at camp this last week asked me a question, because they, they seem to like asking me questions all the time, but they said, what's your greatest fear? What's your greatest fear? And I had to ponder that, and I, you know, I appreciated Lane's comment about, you know, we, we don't have reason to fear. We, we have an overcoming God, but there's things that sometimes, if I had a fear, and I shared this, is that a 
fear that I have is that I have had no impact. That those 30 years would have been in vain. That it would have just been, been madness. It would have just been, man, a colossal waste of time. Because it's tragic to see people walk away from Jesus. And yet it happens. So this is a bit of a, a tragic text in a lot of ways. As we see, 75% are unfruitful upon hearing the word. So this text is both a window and a mirror. It's a window to God to see how he reveals himself to us, how he speaks. And yet it's a mirror to our hearts. How do we receive it? So I hope that that will be your understanding of this text today, that it will be a mirror before you. Where do you see your response to the word? Verse 13 gives us this little clue. It says, if you do not understand, Jesus says, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any of the parables? He's saying this is the key. This is the central parable. Because the word is planted. The word is being sowed. It's being spoken. And if you don't understand it, if you can't, if it doesn't find a place to land on fertile soil in your heart, then you won't understand anything else. So if you have ears, listen, hear it, and allow the word of God to transform your heart. <clears throat> so there's three things, obviously, in this parable. There's the seed, there's the sower, and there's the soil. The seed, Jesus says, is the word of God. And this is not insignificant because what Jesus is doing and what Mark is, is highlighting throughout the gospel is that Jesus is on a pathway. He is on a trajectory to the cross. And so the word of God is, is not ever void of the suffering and the pain and the sacrifice of Jesus. And so if you hear another gospel, then that is not the gospel. That is not the good news. If you only hear the word that says God loves you and he's going to make your life great, it's going to be fantastic. You and Jesus. That's not the gospel. That's not the word that, that is to be sown. So we can't take the cross because the gospel is always cross-shaped. And when you come to that, then there can be a conflict, and that's where people say, I'm out. So the seed is the word of God. Second, there's a sower. Obviously, Jesus is the, the farmer in the picture, ultimate sower. Mark also, as the gospel writer, he is sowing the seed. Today, I am sowing seed to you. I'm, I'm sharing the word of God to you. I'm also the soil that I have to receive this. You and me, whenever we share Jesus, we're sowing seed. Then there's the soil. How is the seed received? Where it lands, that's the heart. These three things are evident in this text. All right, so let's go through briefly um, these four responses. First of all, the seed on the rock. And I'll say this is that you've probably heard numerous sermons on this text because it's a popular one. And as Jesus said, it's the key. So will you receive this? Will you hear it uniquely today? Will it reaffirm or affirm things in you that perhaps you need to hear from Jesus today? So here we go. Seed on the rock. This is, of course, the hard heart. Birds comes. You know, it, it lands on this path. It lands on the path. It doesn't take root. I, I had a patch of grass. I know it was tragic. I had a piece of my grass that was dead. For me, that was like, it's traumatic, right? It's like, oh, how can that happen? But I had to reseed, and as I reseeded, some of it fell on, on the concrete right there. I'm like, well, it's not going to grow there, right? Pretty obvious. Jesus saying, this is the seed that's sown, and it lands on the path. It's packed down. It's hard. Birds come and swoop in and take it away. 
I don't know if you've ever had KFC or Popeyes outside, but man, there are birds that will attack you. You know, you're sitting there and you're just having your snack pack or whatever, you know, and they're just swirling around. You've got a little kid with you having a French fry, just like the cutest little kid, just looking at that French fry, just a bird just comes right in. Like that's, they're, they're vicious. Am I right? They're hungry. I don't know if it's the smell of that fried chicken. Some of you right now are getting so hungry, just me talking about it. But the birds just swarming around. So Jesus is saying the, the Satan just comes in, swoops in on a hard heart, takes it away. The evil one is an active enemy. I'm sure some of you, uh, like us, in, in, even in your own family, close friends, you, you see someone like this that, that's just been hard towards the good news of the gospel. Maybe you've tried sharing it. Maybe they've, you've brought them to a church event. Maybe uh, you've had opportunity to share your testimony with them, and they just say, no, I don't want any part of that. Thanks. But they just receive it as if it was a, a sales tactic or something, and they say, no, I just, I'm not interested in that. Tanya and I both have family members that have, are this hard heart situation. And we see the effect of sin in their life, and we see the effect of the weight of, of the hardness of heart where they've turned to other things. There's always going to be something that will, you will seek to fill your life with. And some have turned to hard drinking and drugs, and they're weathered. They, they're, they look beaten down, but their hearts are hard. In the Old Testament, uh, we, we see that the prophets, they called these people stiff-necked, right? Stubborn. Not going to turn from, from my wickedness, from my ways. I want to do what I want to do. And so this is the case of this person. This heart is it's calloused. It's so hard. You can't penetrate. Chances are that this is not you today. Because you're here. In some form or another, there was a response for you to say, I'm going to come to be in church to hear the word of the Lord. But chances are you know someone. And in, in responding to them, perhaps you're at a place right now where you said, you know what, it's too late for them. It's just, I, there, there's no way they're going to soften towards the gospel. But you know, there's probably some of you here as well that have that have a story, have that family member or that friend from high school that you said, they're never going to respond to Jesus. And yet they did. And they come to you and they say, you know what? I've received Jesus. It's changed my life. And you were just like, whoa. Because that happens. God softens hearts. And so, you know, I don't know the saying, it says the same, the same sun that that melts the ice, hardens clay. Um, so the word, continue. Continue. Don't give up on people in your life that have hard hearts. Keep praying. Keep sharing. And if this is you that's here, um, I, you know, I wish I could convince you. I wish I could walk over to you and like, er, er, you know, turn your ears open so that you would hear it and you would submit to it and you'd receive it and it would change your life, but I can't. But maybe at one point or another, God will stir in your heart, will soften your heart, and you'll hear it, you'll perceive the truth. All right, secondly, there's the seed on the shallow soil. Okay, a little topsoil, it's a hard pan underneath, but there's a little bit of soil, and the seed lands there, and it just springs up. This is uh, familiar to us at camp, in camp ministry. An incredible experience for a kid to come to camp and to sing songs about Jesus and it's so fun we dance we sing and the cabin leaders there and and they they love the kids and and they maybe have never experienced that kind of love or that community before and, and they just say I, I have never heard about the love of God and they receive it with excitement but then they go home, and if they don't have any, any support network at home, and they face hardship or, or persecution or temptation, they might very well be mocked by friends or, or their family, and they get to the point where they say, is, is it worth it? 
or some that we know that perhaps they, they just received Jesus and it was, it was so wonderful for a while and they were on this high. But yeah, then things got difficult. And we hear things like, yeah, that Christianity, it just didn't, didn't take. It just didn't work for me. And right there is the problem because it's not an it. It's never an it. Faith is a person. Faith is a relationship. It's not just a set of, of principles or, or rules or guidelines for your life. It's relationship with Jesus. And he always works for us. God always works for us. We all have a common need. A common cure is available in Jesus. So it's, it's sad, but the reality is they've missed the whole point. This is indeed a, a sad individual, a sad group of people, because once they turn away, it's often very hard for them to hear again. They get, they get angry, they get disappointed. Life didn't turn out the way they did, and God didn't come through for them the way they expected him to. And so this disappointment leads to a, a layer, another layer of, of hardness over them. So I'd say this, consider carefully, my friends, the gospel that you have received. If it was based on a, a supposed promise of a pleasant life, a life free of pain and, and suffering, and God giving you what you want, you are going to experience deep disappointment. And you may sit here in church for a while, but eventually you're going to drift away. And it will be very hard to come back as your heart will have grown cold and calloused. Third, there's a seed among thorns. I hate weeds. I hate thorns. I, I, you know my love for my grass, obviously, already. And, and I get home. I come back from camp three, four days. Uh, I've been gone, and I see there's weeds. And I'm like, how did you get here? Right? I didn't, I didn't plant you. I don't want you there. <laughs> And so, you know, I do what it takes. And I'm grateful that my, my neighbor is, is very much on the same path, you know, you know, as me. It's like, so we keep our lawn free of weeds as much as possible. Then the neighbor, he gets all his weeds and dang like blows all. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but we know the effect of weeds, right? It, it sucks the nutrients out of the plants that you want. Jesus says there's, this causes the plant to, to be non-fruit-bearing, withers, it's choked out by other things, the cares of the world. Let me ask you today, what are the cares of your life right now that are occupying your headspace and your heart space and that's crowding out the word of God and his desire for you? to grow, to bear fruit. Or the deceitfulness of riches, the things that you are chasing. I like it that it says other things. There's other things. It's just general. Because it's different. It's unique for so many of us. Things that will occupy our heart space. Maybe today you look back and you say, I'm really in the same place spiritually as I was 10 years ago. I haven't changed. Nothing's changed. And it's probably, especially if you're here, it's, there's an attraction about Jesus. There's things you like about Jesus. He's done some amazing things for you. And you're, you're trying to be faithful. You like Jesus, but you like everything else too. And your heart's divided. And when your heart is divided, you won't bear fruit. That's what it says. When your heart is divided, you will not bear fruit. And you'll be the same as you were five years ago, ten years ago. 20 years ago, when you look at where your life has gone from the moment that you said yes to Jesus, has there been fruit? Or has there just been 
thorns, thistles, and weeds that have crowded out your heart. I'll say this, as a, as a frequent sower of the seed, uh, for those of us who, who have a regular opportunity to preach here in our church, uh, you know, and for me, I, I must confess that it can be a discouraging statistic, 25%. One in, in four. Many of you are going to sit where you sit, you know, um, weekly. Hear the preaching here on Sunday, and maybe you have for years. Are you yet unchanged? Charles Spurgeon was pretty harsh and fiery with his congregation in London in the 1800s. As he preached this particular text, he focused firmly on this thorn-infested soil, as he identified that as his primary Sunday audience. He said this. I'm sorry if this has a little bit of a sting to it, but I'm going on vacation, so send an email. I won't receive it. He said this. Without fruit, the sower's work would even seem to be insane. For he takes good wheat, throws it away, and loses it on the ground. Preaching is the idlest of occupations if the word be not adapted to enter the heart and produce good results. Oh, my hearers, if you are not converted, I waste time and energy in standing here. Men might well think it madness, madness, that one day, one whole day, or one hour of the day in the week should be given up to hearing speeches. Madness, indeed, it would be if nothing came to it, came of it, to conscience and heart. If you do not bring forth fruit unto holiness and the end is not everlasting life, I should be better employed in breaking stones on the roadside than in preaching to you. If it produces in you holiness and love to God and man, then we know that there is good soil in you. But if you are merely promising people, but not performing people, then we know that the ground of your heart is hard or stony or thorny. He says, it is a very lamentable case, is it not, that a man should believe the gospel to be true and yet live as if it were a lie. If it be the truth, why do you not yield obedience to it? hope that you will not fear or feel that I am speaking only down to you. I hear myself in this. Is there change in my life? Is there distractions in me? If it is true, why am I not obeying it more? Fourth, there is, of course, the seed that is good soil that takes root. To carry on the, the mark and math that we talked about last week, if you missed that one, you can watch it uh, later. But um, the mark in math, this one includes multiplication. There is exponential growth described here only because of God. His kingdom grows despite our failures. And that is the hope. And that is, that is why I look back and say 30 years, uh, it's the 25%. I don't give up on the others because I'm thankful that God doesn't give up on me. <laughs> But man, that 25% that's fruitful, that gets it, that their, their ears hear it, and then they seek to apply it and obey it, man, that just gets you going. Is that me? Is that you? Jesus says it's 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. That's incredible growth. That's what happens when the kingdom of God and the word of God takes root. This last week, and I'll close with this, um, we had a, a lady at, at camp, I'll call her uh, Sarah, and she, she came to camp 20 years ago, and she came to me after chapel the one day, and she said, I would like the opportunity to share with your staff.
because I'd like them to hear the impact on a life. And so she, she shared her story with our staff. That 20 years ago when she was 12 years old, she was in a very rough situation in her family. Religious, but, but law-focused, not grace-focused family. Abusive. And there was a man that was familiar with her family that paid for her and her sister to go to camp. Never experienced a community like that. Never experienced love of God like that. And she just received it. One man, a little bit of money, go to camp. One cabin leader, just loved her, accepted her, despite the clothes that she wore that didn't look like anyone else's or what she could understand. She received Jesus. It changed the whole trajectory of her life. Went home and told her mom. Her mom became a Christian and, and their family was able to start afresh. And now she's, she's married, has kids, and brought them to camp 20 years later. So the fruit... It was a heart that was soft towards God, heard the message, received it, changed everything. This is what happens when the seed of God's word falls on good soil. I'll say this as we close. Um, if you have ears to hear today, what is God saying to you? If you allow his word to be a mirror to see your heart, what's it showing? And if you identify yourself in one of the four soils, let me ask you, are, are you content? Are you content with that? Is God? And what are you willing to do about it? Or has this all just been madness? God, we can be a stubborn, blind, hard-hearted people. We can choose to do what we want to do. We can allow things to just grow alongside um, the beautiful seed of the Word of God that transforms us. And so, Lord, I pray that as we seek to hear, uh, we will truly perceive and it will lead us actually doing something about it that we would act on it and God we trust you for the fruit you are the one who will bring the harvest in Jesus name That was close. I'm going to invite you to either stand or sit, whatever you want to do right now. Give me eyes to see more of who you are. May what I behold still my anxious heart. You take what I am known and break it all apart. For you, my God, the greater still. And no sky contains, no doubt restrains all oh, you. The greatness of our God. I spend my life to know I'm far from close to all you are. The greatness of our God.
Give me grace to see beyond this moment here and to believe that there is nothing left to fear that you alone are high above it all you my god a greater still and no sky contains no doubt restrains all oh, you are the great mist of our god i spend my life of our God, and there is nothing that can never separate us, there is nothing that can ever separate us from your love, no life, no death, of this I am convinced you, my God, the greatest day. greatness of our God. I spent my life to know I'm far from close to all you are. The greatness of our God. And no sky contains, no doubt restrains all you are. The greatness of our God. I spent my life of our God. You can remain standing if you'd like for the benediction today, and we'll sing another song after. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as always, we have a debit machine at the back and a, and a box there if you have a, an offering that you would like to contribute, or as always, through our, our uh, e-transfer at College Drive Church at gmail.com. Leave you with this from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May God bless you. It's your love that took our place It's your blood that gives us liberty We are thankful for the cross On the cross mercy was revealed for the cost there you died and rose again we are thankful for the cross and by your blood we stand forgiven you have overcome Your blood, we stand.
forgiven, you have overcome. Now we are living in the light of all you've done. To everything you are, we surrender. We surrender by your blood. We stand forgiven, you have overcome. Thank you, everyone. Go in peace.